Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, and welcome to worship on this Easter Sunday. We are delighted that you are here. If you're visiting with us, we extend a special welcome to you. You can find out more about our church at fbcgreensboro.org. I hope that you received in the mail last week a letter about our phased reopening plans. We are very excited that soon we will be in person, at least in a limited way. On May 2nd, we are going to have worship at the Greensboro Grasshopper Ball Field. You can find out more about it on the website and you can register to join us. After that, starting May 9th, we'll have two worship services here in the sanctuary at 8.30 and 11. And again, you can register for those on the website. I want to thank Maggie Turner. She has been dedicated to her service here at the church for many years. And we are saying a bittersweet farewell to her as she retires on April 30th. Let me share with you just a little bit about Maggie. She began working here full time in April of 1999. She was instrumental in creating several ministries of care, including First Friends, the health ministry team, flu clinics, and so much more. She first retired in December of 2010, but she accepted an invitation to return in 2015. She has worked with our pastoral care team. She has developed so many relationships. We are going to miss her. If you would like to wish her well, you can email her at mturner at fpcgreensboro.org. Thank you, Maggie. Let us continue in our worship. Hello, everyone. My name is Lavonda Williams. Um, I've been employed at the Presbyterian Church for about five years. I enjoy my job, enjoy the staff, and seeing the kids. I know the pandemic has is going on, we don't get to see them as much, but we can see them through the window. So um, I hope everybody being safe and take care. Hi, I'm Franklin, Franklin Brown, uh, Director of Housekeeping Service. I've uh, been here at the church since 1971. Uh, I love what I do. Uh, primary responsibility is uh, for the building upkeep, <laughs> the cleaning, uh, we love, we love what we do. Uh, we're hoping very soon that we can open the doors of the church back, so all of us can get back into church. Uh, thanks, and God bless. Please join me in our call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. This is the good news we have received, in which we stand and by which we are saved. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. That Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again on the third day. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. He appeared to Peter and to the twelve and to many faithful witnesses. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. At last he came to us that we might come to believe and proclaim this good news to the world. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed.
invite those who have risen for song to please be seated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if we say we are without sin, then we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is merciful, will forgive us and grant us peace. I invite us now as a community of faith to confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We disregard the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy, Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. Friends, this water is the water of our baptism. It washes us clean. It restores our souls. It makes us whole again. Know that through the risen Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Know this and be at peace this day. And since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us pray. God, Source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding, that our hearts and minds may be opened. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Listen for the word of God. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces, he will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, friends, and happy Easter to all of you. I'm so glad that you are joining us for worship on this special Sunday, and I cannot wait to be in person with you very soon. So, of course, Easter Sunday is a very special Sunday, probably maybe the most special Sunday in the life of our church and our faith and Christian community around the world. So today, to celebrate Easter, I want to share with you a special book this book is new to me, uh, and I'm excited to share it with you. As I read, I want you to listen. Listen to the words I read, look at the pictures, see if there's anything new or different about the way the Easter story is told in this book. Something maybe you haven't heard before or haven't thought about. And when I finish reading, I'm going to give you some questions to wonder about and talk about with your family or friends or neighbors as you go through the day today. So let's begin. "'Twas the morning of Easter, written by Glynis Nellist and illustrated 
by Elena Silovanova. He has risen. Matthew 28, verse 6. Twas the morning of Easter. Twas the morning of Easter before the sun rose. Two guards on a hillside were just starting to doze. You see, Jesus had died only three days before. A huge stone had been placed to seal the tomb door. In her small, quiet home, not too far away, Jesus' friend Mary was planning the day. She would go to the cave with perfume and spice in hopes that her gifts would make Jesus smell nice. The sun through the trees was just starting to peep at the guards on the hill who were now fast asleep. When all of a sudden there came an earthquake and the rocks and the trees all started to shake. The guards jumped in fright and then fell straight to the floor as the stone rolled away and unsealed the door. Then Mary arrived and crept up to the cave. She had to see Jesus. She had to be brave. But the cave was now empty. He just wasn't there. Mary sat down and wept, and her cries filled the air. But suddenly Mary heard someone behind. Dear woman, who is it that you hope to find? Mary jumped and turned round, so confused and afraid. Was this man the gardener? And why had he stayed? But the calm in his voice, the words that he said, soon let Mary know she had nothing to dread. Dear Mary, it's me. It's Jesus, your friend. My story's just starting. That wasn't the end. His eyes, how they twinkled, his smile so bright. Mary knew in a moment, but could she be right? She gasped in surprise and cried, Jesus, it's you. You came back to life. Your promise came true. Jesus nodded and said, but there's no time to lose. You must tell the disciples, go, spread the good news. So she jumped to her feet and away Mary went. She had a story to tell, a tale heaven sent. She ran without stopping and called through the door, disciples, you've never heard this news before. Now Peter, now James, now Thomas, now John, I went to the cave. Jesus' body was gone. But he called me by name. He's alive. It is true. It's a miracle only our great God could do. Then the trees seemed to dance. Birds started to sing. All creation joined in to worship the king. He's alive. He's alive. The rocks cried in praise. The whole earth rejoiced on this day of all days. When later that night, Mary knelt down to pray, she thought about all that had happened that day. And the stars heard her whisper through soft evening light, Happy Easter to all, and to all a good night. The end. So I wonder, what was your favorite part of that story? I wonder what surprised you about that story. And I wonder what this story means for us today here in Greensboro and around the world. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day, for this Easter Sunday. We thank you for the signs of spring and new life that are all around us and for the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. 
as we celebrate today with plastic eggs and treats and lots of fun, help us to remember this amazing story and the real reason for our rejoicing. We ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen.
Friends, our gospel lesson this morning comes to us from the gospel according to Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Hear now the word of God. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The women were distraught. They had remained with Jesus and watched the horror unfold a few days prior. They had witnessed the pain and experienced the helplessness of his torture and execution. They were the ones who refused to run away and refused to turn away. Their stalwart presence, even if from a distance, is a testament to their love for their friend. In their grief, their shock, their despair, not knowing what to do, they did what they knew, they went to care for the body of their beloved Lord. They went to the graveyard to give him the gifts in death that were denied him in the last moments of his life. They went to give him the gifts of dignity, of touch and tenderness and companionship and compassion. They observed the Sabbath and then went to the tomb, spices in hand, aware of a real and looming obstacle that could prevent their getting to Jesus, the stone. It was very large, too big for them to move, even if the three of them channeled their hurt and pushed with all their strength. What about the stone? They asked each other. Can't you imagine the conversation? Mary Magdalene walking with purpose, her face set towards the graveyard, worrying about that huge rock that could block their ability to get to the body they both longed and dreaded to see. Maybe the three of them strategized and speculated. Maybe they thought someone in the cemetery might be there to help them. I wonder if any of them believed that God might make a way. I wonder if any of them even said aloud some of the words that Jesus had spoken to them, words about mustard seed sized faith that could move mountains and roll away stones too. Maybe they thought they could at least leave the spices and the oil as an offering and know that they did the very best they could under the circumstances. I picture them in their pain and their hurt, seeing that tomb open as they approach the graveside, stunned that their greatest worry had not come to fruition. And it makes me think of all the large stones that I've obsessed over in my life. Stones that God had rolled away well before I even came close to encountering them. Obstacles that I had believed to be utterly immovable and inevitable and certain that never materialized. The stone that the women anticipated was not where it was supposed to be. 
And there were more inevitable certainties that weren't there either. Jesus' body, the one they saw taken lifeless from the cross, it's not in the grave. Instead, there is a young man dressed in white who has a message for them. You see, they go to anoint a dead body, and instead, God gives them a living word. They go for closure, and instead, their world is blown wide open. They go thinking they have to solve a straightforward, finite problem, and instead they get invited into the most magnificent, eternal mystery in all creation. They go to perform one final act of service for the Lord they love, and instead they get enlisted to begin the proclamation that God has redeemed the world. This is the reality of Easter. This is the truth of resurrection. It turns our expectations upside down. It is Easter that makes a beginning out of an ending, that makes a way when there seems to be no way. It's Easter that takes whatever we bring to Jesus and uses it for the good of all creation. It is Easter that takes evil and violence and transforms them into grace and into redemption. It's Easter that reveals that the last word is not one of sin and death, but instead is the word made flesh that cannot be silenced. It's Easter that tells us don't fixate on the stones that we assume will block our path, but remember that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Samuel Wells in his book, Be Not Afraid, writes this. He writes, Easter is either everything or it is nothing. It's either a doomed attempt to overcome suffering and death with lilies, drums, cymbals, brass, and a descant on the last verse. Or it's a peek through a keyhole into a world completely changed by Jesus. And my friends, if we believe it to be the latter, then as Brian Blunt writes, we ought to be hell bent on representing the promise of resurrection here and now. We expend a lot of time and energy and resources on the very large stones we perceive to be problems, when instead we are called to remember the promise and the power of God's living word. Samuel Wells reminds us that we are not given a script we are given a savior and a story. Easter calls us to follow our savior to Galilee, enter the mystery of God's salvation story and live the next chapter of it. What a difficult year it has been. What a painful year our world has endured. For a second Easter, we will not have the lilies, the drums, the cymbals, the brass, or a descant on the last verse. Not in person, not together, not in this space that summons us to look up and see Jesus. We can't even pretend that these things overcome suffering and death. We find ourselves with Mary and Mary and Salome like that very first Easter, having witnessed death and suffering, worried about immovable barriers to a hoped for future, just making our way to Jesus no matter his state or ours. 
and we're anxious. We're anxious about what we will discover. We want to know what will remain, what is lost forever, what has changed, what can be changed, what do we wish we could change. We anticipate problem after problem, and rightfully so, given what we've recently experienced. And yet, what we will surely discover, no less than those faithful women before us, is an open tomb and an empty grave and our risen Lord already in Galilee, just as he promised. On Easter, we don't encounter an insurmountable problem. Instead, we are invited into a mystery that renders us awestruck and humbled and at least for a little while speechless. And it is in this silence that we are invited to peek through that Easter keyhole and take a long, loving look at all creation. We are to see everything through a resurrection lens. To not fixate on problems, but embrace the holy mystery of salvation and envision God's promised future to see the world completely changed by Jesus and be hell-bent on representing it here and now. March 31st, 1997 was a Monday. It was an Easter Monday to be exact. The evening before I had talked to my father-in-law, we were living in Philadelphia. I was nearing the end of my first trimester of my first pregnancy. Joe had called us from his home in North Carolina to wish us a happy Easter. He called most Sunday evenings. And on this one, he was particularly cheerful. He had served as the chalice bearer for the early service at his Episcopal church. It was a role he cherished in a place he loved. On a day when he had heard lift high the cross, complete with a trumpet descant. After church, he spent the day in his yard. The daffodils were blooming and the dogwoods were beginning to flower. After Grant and I hung up the phone, we thought nothing more about the call that night. It was quintessential Joe, enjoying simple but profound things, expressing his deep love in reserved ways, dutifully keeping in touch. The next morning, Easter Monday, Joe went to work. He had a massive heart attack and he died before they could get him to the hospital. That Easter phone call was our last conversation. And Grant and I have often relived that Easter Sunday. You know those kind of days. You picture them like a movie. Some of it is in slow motion. There are moments frozen perfectly in time. And every Easter since that one, we relive that day. And we cannot help but lament all that has been missed. We wish our children could have known him. The things that were endearing about him, and yes, the things that were frustrating about him too. But this Easter, for some reason, my thoughts are not so much about what we've lost, but rather on all the beautiful things that continue to live on. I have been thinking about Joe's love for the church that lives on in our family. He might regret that his grandchildren aren't Episcopalian, 
but he would rejoice that they want to be in worship today. His work ethic and the importance of doing work ethically still bears fruit in his children and in all the people he informally mentored. His thoughtfulness in small things done quietly is oh so evident when I see Grant putting snacks and a little bit of cash in the front seat of our daughter's car before she goes back to college. This Easter, without so much of what I wanted Easter to be, I see more clearly the power of resurrection. I feel more deeply Jesus' promise to give life eternal and abundant, no matter our earthly circumstances. I feel this nagging, alarming, nascent, spirit-filled hope that I think is going to enlist me in far much more than I went to the graveyard to do. In this year, of so much loss and hurt and pain and upheaval, instead of fixating on the very large stones that only God can roll away, I find myself peeking through the keyhole of resurrection to see that God has changed everything through Jesus. I get little glimpses of spears turned into plowshares. I can squint and see God wiping the tears from all the faces. I can imagine that death is being swallowed up whole. I'm surveying the scene to see captives freed and children welcomed. And that party for the prodigal, I think his older brother is there too. I'm starting to envision the stranger as my friend and justice cascading through our streets. On the other side of this year, this Easter, I'm imagining what it will be like to participate in God's jubilee. And I know there are a lot of problems to solve. There are a lot of obstacles that want to keep us from Jesus. There are lots of issues that need to be addressed. But this Easter, can we first and foremost be awestruck and overwhelmed by the mystery of God's unstoppable love made evident in Jesus' resurrection. Can we remember that Easter Sunday transforms even the most painful of Easter Mondays, promising life, eternal, everlasting, abundant, and evident when we peek through the keyhole of resurrection and know that Jesus has changed everything completely for good. This unadorned Easter. Let's look through the lens of resurrection and see earth as it is in heaven. And know that God has removed every barrier between them. Let's enter the Easter mystery. Let's follow our Savior to Galilee. And let's live this resurrection story right here and right now. Amen.
with me now as we affirm our faith using the ecumenical apostles creed let us say together what we believe i believe in god the father almighty creator of heaven and earth i believe in jesus christ god's only son our lord who was conceived by the holy spirit born of the virgin mary suffered under pontius pilate was crucified died and was buried he descended to the dead on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now let us pray. Almighty One, as we have heard the great story of Easter morning, show us now how you can open up solutions to those stones of ours sealed in front of our doors and help us to see that you can roll away our stones and find a solution and turn things upside down and make a new way that there might be transformation from death to life, from despair to hope, from evil and violence to grace and transformation. We thank you, O oh God, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that you have taught us to pray together this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are very grateful for your continued generosity and invite you to support the ministries, the outreach of this congregation, either online or through the mail.
Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Go into the world and live this resurrection story. And as you do, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen.